This is Robert Capuccio. Welcome to the Self Help Antidote, a weekly dose of reason, perspective, and insight, where we challenge conventional thinking and explore authentic strategies and insights around personal transformation. Our commitment to you is to bring you some of the world's leading experts in the domains of fitness, wellness, coaching, and behavior change, separating fact from fallacy. Hello, Tiffany. Hi, Bobby. All right, that was not admittedly our best intro ever, but it was okay. We're underway. Hello, yeah. listeners. Welcome back. If this is your first time, welcome to Roll With The Punches and the Self-Help Antidote. Today, we're going to talk about resilience, facts, and fiction. It's a big topic, resilience. I think given the past couple of years we've had, I'm, I'm, I've got to stop saying that, but it is post pandemic and the world has not gone back to normal and it never will. Mm -hmm. I don't want to keep saying the new normal because change happens all throughout history. We're just in a different cycle of change, but resilience is something that people have become keenly aware that they need. However, there's a lot of advice on how to go about getting it. And some is very good. Some is potentially precarious. And we're just going to talk about a couple of those things on this show and just, you know, where you are right now. Because no matter where you are, actually, at some point in your life, you're going to need resilience. Let, let's start with a working definition of what we mean when we talk about resilience in the first place. My definition of resilience is kind of similar to an engineering structural resilience. How much strain and stress can you take and still return back to optimum functionality? Yeah. So it's kind of like a, an exercise tubing. How much stress can I put on that exercise tubing? And even though it conforms to that stress and deforms under stress, when you let go, if you haven't stressed it beyond its capacity, it returns to the normal shape it was at before you picked it up. That's mm -hmm. what makes it functional, workable. A bridge functions the same way. It doesn't resist creep and deformation. It actually yields to it a little bit. And it's, it, it's in that yield, not too much, just enough, that allows it to become flexible under strain, especially like things like an earthquake, which is good. I mean, not earthquakes. Earthquakes are, are very, very bad. But if you happen to be on that bridge during an earthquake, the greater resilience that bridge has, well, the better off you are. So that aspect is good. That is true. It only sort of hit my awareness in quite recent times talking about the idea of the misconceptions of resilience and the ways or when we – assume or say that we are being resilient when in fact we're being something completely different to resilience. What do you mean? Different how? Um, I, I think pulling in the query around the difference between uh, dissociation and resilience. You know, there's being resilient okay. or there's or there's not accepting. There's there's suppressing. So suppressing one's emotions or response to a big thing is not resilient. So and so does not have the when same you say effect. Say suppressing someone's response or emotions. That's what you mean, just to be clear, by dissociation. Yeah. Yeah. And dissociation is not something that you're consciously aware of necessarily. Mm. Mm. But I think there's like when we look at how people can react to a particular situation and we're very quick to call them resilient, but sometimes we might be looking at somebody who is in the middle of a trauma response that they're not aware of. Well, it's kind of hard to tell. Like what what are the indicators in, in your mind about someone who is truly responding in a way that demonstrates resilience and somebody who might be having a dissociative response. Hmm, I think it's a really tricky one actually for the person in the middle of it. But I remember talking somewhat on this with Dr. Bruce Perry and questioning him about dissociation and getting his opinion that you know, he thinks it gets a really bad rap and that dis dissociation is in fact in, it's, it can be a superpower 
the ability to dissociate in moments. However, I think we need awareness on the fact that it may have happened. Like I look back at my experience in the boxing ring and there was dissociation from from my emotions and from the heightened response. I didn't have this, the typical heightened response to how I felt or how I processed what was going on in the moment because I was mm-hmm. kind of dissociated because in conflict conflict situations of danger like that, I had this I don't matter, I don't it's not it's not safe to feel. That was a response and I didn't know I had it until I started querying myself years later and going, I don't really you know, I didn't the same would happen with my emotions to responses in relationships or conversations where I would, you know, even in a work context, have demands placed on me, like, can we do, like, let's do this, and I'd respond, and then a few days later I'd go, oh, I'm really not, I'm really unhappy about that, or I really, that rubs me the wrong way, or I don't feel good about that, but I didn't have the feelings till three days later because I was, I guess, kind of emotionally dissociated. So it's from- not like you felt, oh, I, I don't know if this is this is for me, I don't know if I really want to say yes to that. But let mm. me say yes anyway, because you know that that's maybe a coping strategy. Yeah, I'll people be safe, pleasing, I'll be conforming, loved, I'll be accepted. Yeah, it was like you just didn't have the emotion to register. Oh, this just doesn't sit well with me. So you agreed to it, and then days later it hit you that oh wait, hold on, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Yeah, and I had enough awareness around this this for myself that in 2020 when we went into lockdown and I from the get go felt. Um, opportunity and uh, a sense of agency around oh, this is something really great's going to come of this. At the same time of thriving in the middle of that, I was very keenly watching myself and questioning. I'm well aware that maybe this is a coping mechanism. Maybe I'm a bit dissociated. Maybe I'm thriving in in trauma. And I had to wait. I had. To, I was just. I waited for so long to go. Am I going to? come out of this and collapse? Am I going to have... Thriving in trauma. Yeah. Am I going to have a breakdown statement. or am I actually present in the middle of this? Am I resilient because of what I've been through or am I still in much a trauma state that's not healthy? I think, I think it's when... Here's an example of dissociation because I've experienced it multiple times in my life but where there was almost a collective dissociation, 9-11. So 9-11, I lived right by the World Trade Center. Like they they came down just about on my apartment. Um, Like I could have thrown a rock and hit the towers from where I was living at the time. And what was interesting is when, when we first when we first were watching, so I was supposed to go to Washington, D.C. that day. I don't know if any of this is relevant, but I was supposed to give, give a seminar in Washington, D.C. But what happened was like, oh, okay, wait, hold on. Don't go anywhere. Plane hit the towers. And we're all thinking the same thing. We're like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a strange thing to happen. What a tragic accident. And we're watching the news and you see the second plane. It's like, okay, this is not an accident at all. Um, we're under attack. Okay. And what we were told, there was so much misinformation and we were told like eight planes were hijacked at one point and, you know, there's two more coming back to Manhattan. So we're in Midtown. We're like, okay, it's likely us. I remember when we poured out of the office buildings, we were all evacuated and pushed into Central Park. There was such a sense of calm. And as a matter of fact, I had a stomachache that morning. I was like, I, I remember this clearly. I think I had just like shoved a bagel in my gob quickly because <laughs> I was like, I got to get to the office, check in, because I didn't, I, I didn't want to go to the office. I wanted to go straight to Washington, D.C., but, you know, like last minute changes, you know, we have to change tons of stuff for absolutely no reason at all. And so I went to the office like, oh, man, I ate that too quick. I'm really sick, really sick. When we got to Central Park, I wasn't sick at all. I felt fine. And there was an overwhelming sense of calm from everybody. Mm. Like we were kind of like 
curious. We, we, we were on alert, but not nearly the level of panic you would have thought. And the people I was with, I just remember, like, this is, this is kind of weird how absolutely calm we were. And we were just talking about everyday stuff. We were just talking about work. We were talking about business. We were talking about, like, I don't know what modifications we were going to make to our next foundations course, which is, which is kind of interesting to think about that. I mean, of mm-hmm. course, later in the day when I, I went back home, because my girlfriend at the time was at my apartment, so I had to go. Things got far more intense. But I just remember that particular time. It was like, oh, okay, that's that that's interesting. I think with dissociation, like a lot of responses, they're all positive. Something that gets you through something that otherwise would be incomprehensible, unbearable, mm-hmm. psychologically damaging is beneficial. Mm. It's when we chronically hold on to it where it creates maladaptive responses in our life or when it becomes an identity, a certain reaction. That's where we we kind of have to be concerned. And there's this thing, and it's a popular saying in our society related to resilience, and that is, well, the key to resilience is to go through a lot of traumatic shit. And, and I just want to, I, I just want to say that I, I was in a, I was in a group last night, a group discussion on Zoom. Turned out to be better than I thought it was going to be. It was a really good discussion. And you know, somebody brought up in discussing their own trauma. Stress is not trauma. As a matter of fact, you know, it, it's kind of like the Yerkes Dobson curve. If you have too little stress in your life, your life absolutely sucks. You're bored. You're, there's no juice. There's no excitement. Your favorite team wins. Your like favorite sporting event. That's stressful. You know, you you ask out the person you were terrified about asking out, and they say yes. That's stressful, but that's exciting. That's you stress, not distress. Mm. It's very different. Too much stress and. That's catastrophic to our mental and physical health. But stress itself, you want to be somewhere in the middle. There's a sweet spot and it's different for everyone. You want to be within that curve. So you want equal challenge and excitement and and, and chances to decompress. Yeah. But adversity is also not trauma. Trauma is something that is so devastating, it changes your wiring in a way that creates maladaptive problems. And and this statement is based on the fact that if you experience enough stressful things or traumatic things, you will somehow be stronger. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I think when it comes to stress, that's true. If you're constantly putting yourself in the face of challenge and stressful situations, you become more habituated to it. But I, I, I read a couple of books last week. I read Emergent Strategy by Adrian, Adrian Mary. I hope that's how you pronounce that, Brown. And I read Tribe, again, by Sebastian Younger. And you know, that, without getting into it, so... He was talking about that, and he cited there's an analysis from the Institute of Medicine and the National Research Council, both of these organizations, and they were looking at what are some of the most significant significant contributing factors to whether or not a soldier will develop PTSD as a result of their experience in combat. And one of the most significant factors was did that soldier experience early childhood, not not necessarily adversity, but trauma? Were they a victim of child abuse? Mm. So if they had one or more traumatic experiences as, as a kid, it increased the probability, one of the most significant factors, increasing the probability about whether or not they would experience PTSD in combat. So I had nothing to do with attitude or, or training. You know, these guys are all very well trained or mental toughness. These are all very tough individuals with a lot of grit. Obviously, it had to do with what their brain had been exposed to earlier. Mm-hmm. So, so, so trauma is not an inoculation for future trauma. It, in a lot of ways, acts as a predisposition. Yeah, and then there's also that like the idea that we don't all remember like so 
some of us can have childhood trauma and no memory of it. Mm. Like that's that, really interesting. Oh man, I, I you know, oof, man, I, I'm not going to name names because otherwise, I, I, I think I shouldn't even be talking about this. Um, but just, just keeping names strictly out of it, speaking cryptically, I know someone who this is a tragic story, whose daughter went to a psychologist for something seemingly unrelated. Mm. And in therapy, it came out that she was sexually abused mm. by dad. Oh. And she had absolutely, wait, hold on. Hold on, before you react to this, the story gets worse. Um, she had no recollection of it whatsoever. And then it all came back. And the family, their response was swift and brutal. Like, we don't ever want to see you again. Um, this guy got reported to child services and mm -hmm. it's like, you are a predator and you have lost all rights to see your family. And we're just going to put you on a watch list. And he was like, I, I would never do this to my daughter. And she's like, I clearly remember this. And it turns out that the age that it was coming up, um, this is horrible that this had happened to her was a time when he was on the road quite a bit and he was hardly home. Mm. And I think that's one of the things that he struggled with as a dad. Mom had boyfriends during that time when dad was away and one of her boyfriends actually had done this and, you know, she had blocked the, the daughter had blocked this memory out. And now she had, accused her father who up until then, you know, aside from struggling with the fact that hadn't been around when she was a lot younger. Oh man. Could you imagine like the guilt now? Yeah. And like she had accused him, the family had broken apart. There was no repairing relationship with mom and dad, not because of the affair, but because of, of that situation and all of that pain and those emotions. And, she did repair her relationship with her dad. Well, reconcile anyway. Who knows how much she could repair it. And what a horrific situation mm. for absolutely everybody all around it in that scenario. Yet the point is, it was it, it was so disturbing. She had buried that memory for a very, very long time. Oh, so it sure. came up in, yeah, and uh, like, I know, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, but like, you know, with me and my wife, my wife has gone through horrific things in her childhood. And, you know, when we like talking to somebody, it, it, I, I, it's not that she's becoming aware of it. She's always been aware, but now she's acknowledging the, the, the depth of pain uh, uh, and, and severity associated with some of those circumstances. Mm -hmm. I know I'm speaking cryptically, but you know, I, you know, I kind of have to, mm -hmm. but um, it, yeah, when something's painful enough, even my own life, it's like, uh, it, you know, I, I know Craig Hopper, my wife has been like, you know, you should write a book about, you know, your life. And it's like, well, there's so much about my life. I don't remember the way mm -hmm. I remember things is when somebody will bring up something i'll go oh this happened but i couldn't tell you what happened in my childhood unless something triggers that memory mm, yeah you know? yeah like in um on a more positive note me and my wife we were out in um where were we i think it was newport rhode island what a beautiful town that is people were amazing it was pissing down rain, just nonstop rain, but we were having the best time. And we met these people and we wound up just hanging out at a bar and they started talking about uh, football, soccer in the US. And she instantly had a memory of being really hungry and having no shoes, but there was a football. And when there was a football, everybody forgot that they were hungry. 
because and she like started crying and it was, it was just this beautiful memory you know like kind of like a bittersweet memory and it, it's just it's those things that trigger you but yeah very often you suppress those those memories mm. and dr bill on previous episodes when we've talked about this childhood stuff this was really interesting is um because he's not the only one that's that's said it that not enough of the right stuff is actually more detrimental than mm-hmm. too much of the wrong stuff and not enough of the right stuff doesn't appear to be in our own minds trauma you know so yeah i look at wow. so you know for me realizing that at a certain age i started to be exposed to sexual assault and when I started to look at that as an adult and go, oh, all right, I probably should, you know, that popped into my mind. I went, oh, yeah, that that happened and I kind of had suppressed it. Like I knew, but I'd worked so hard to suppress it that it kind of didn't exist. And then I pulled it out and went, well, should work through this. It was the idea of going, there was, you know, I had a great, so I had this idea that I had a great childhood and I did and I've got a great family and, and everything but the realizing that the circumstances of my parents moving into a shop when I was three and how as a three-year-old I processed the availability of people around me was actually where the a lot of my today things come from, not from the abuse that I was exposed to. So the abuse was one thing that obviously layered a whole bunch of stuff on top and that you know, definitely comes with its own set of challenges, but the real stuff, the stuff that really shaped who I was. Cause, and the, the reason I looked into this was understanding, you know, through these conversations and with, with some of the experts on the show and realizing that these formative years, these years, you know, your first couple of years, first two to three years. And then I was like, Oh, attachment is formed in those years. And I was like, Oh, that's interesting. Cause I looked at, a lot of my personality traits and the way I interact and create relationships, I looked at everything as to this, in inverted commas, trauma of abuse. And I was like, no, this stuff existed. This Actually, the abuse was something that kind of came because of the ecosystem I was already in. So yeah, that's that, 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 yeah. that is interesting. It's the things you don't get rather than the the blatantly negative things you do experience. Yeah. I, I've always wondered that, like in my own life. Yeah. And I think I mean I mean you've you've been through so much, Bobby, but you've developed in such a this compassionate way. And sometimes I hear of parts of your story and think how you know and this is the other thing is we can't like there's no one's at fault no one did harm to me to create what became a challenge in my life no one there's no one there's no blame for anyone on that that's just a circumstance nobody had awareness on and this and the circumstance I was in and then how I developed and you know it's it's amazing you've kind of you've had the opposite you've been put in in those early years, in all of the circumstances that, I mean, I should be sitting here talking to you behind bars as a psychopath, you know, like you you could have very well become a very different human, but you're so emotionally connected and self-aware and compassionate and empathetic, and it's amazing. I'm only, I'm only a serial killer on weekends. I just ah. think it just takes... I usually only see you on a Thursday, so again. just juggling, you know, social life, you know, <laughs> the life, the work, you know, the podcast. It's just, you know, it's, it's, lot, just, it's yeah. just way too much. You know, the digging, the burying, the stuff. It's just, oh, yeah, it's just, it's just, it's just. I can actually see two old guys in Brooklyn having this conversation, like, oh, yeah, the, 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 the. The stabbing and the chasing and the, uh, it's just, it's, it's not as easy as it used to be. Oh. Now it's, when I was younger, it was so much easier. <laughs> you. 
<laughs> now they've got they track it. They got the GPS. It's just yeah. Anyway, so I don't know what I'm talking about. I don't know where I was going with that joke. Um, it was just it was just an epic fail on every single level. But I do look forward to being one of those old guys in in some city complaining about something. Hopefully not complaining that, you know, serial killing is not what it used to be. And I'm thinking of quitting. Uh, not a good career to get into in the first place. I, I mean, think what you might have been doing was deflecting all of the positive things I just said about you. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Uh, I just, I feel very uncomfortable with things like that. But um, yeah, so I'm a little bit messed up in that. Moving on. So there's... I think what what happens with another another misconception around resilience is the over index on mental toughness. I think grit and mental toughness is one aspect of it, hmm. but it's like you've got to keep grinding and grinding no matter what happens. You've got to persevere. And it, you know what's interesting? When I was reading Emergent Strategy, the author brought this up, Brown. You know, she was talking about modeling after nature. If you have a philosophy, and this is this is kind of brilliant. I don't know if it works for every circumstance, but I had this conversation many years ago with a CEO that I worked with. I said, you know, if you have a philosophy in a culture, in an organization, hold that philosophy up against nature and see if it compares. So if nature works in contradiction to your philosophy, and your philosophy, rather than making you well because it's against nature, makes you sick, you, you only have to come to one or two assumptions. That nature has not caught up with the brilliance of your philosophy and self-corrected for its own errors, or your philosophy is wrong. And I'm, I'm not saying which one is which, but I, I would suspect that there's a chance that it might be the latter and not the former. <laughs> And if you look at nature, you look at physiology, like what makes somebody truly strong in the gym? And I'm speaking not from someone who used to, you know, teach this from a scientific perspective, but someone who's experienced both very positive and well, as we've discussed on this podcast, very negative outcomes when I've ignored it. You know, you don't get stronger from training. Mm -hmm. I remember we had a company I worked with, we, we had someone on, and they are a world-renowned leader in you know, neurophysiology, functional anatomy. They are brilliant. And they were talking about if every workout you are getting progressively weaker, it's time to pull back and rest. And you know, in the comments, <laughs> never read the comments. There were so many trolls like, oh, shut up, old man. What do you know? And it's like, it, it, it's like you get stronger from training, not from not from resting. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm glad you're proud of your deep misunderstanding of biology, but no, you actually don't. That strength, that growth, that progress comes from going into the gym and facing challenge and training really hard, then training maybe not so hard. And then not training at all. And it's mm. in it's in the rest or at least the active rest that you're getting that progress. I think that's the thing with resilience. You got to know when to grind, when to persevere, when to condition yourself to push forward and when to back off and allow adaptation to occur. Mm. It's yeah. like Mendeley having the, the periodic table come to him, not when he was trying to force it, but in a dream when he let go. <laughs> Yeah, it's the variables, it's the, you know, your body adapting, but also the moments when you you need your mind to push through what your body can. So there's these moments where you have to go beyond the body to prove to your mind what its capacity is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the, definitely. The, the body can always do more than we ask of it, but we can't do that consistently. But also if we don't ever do it, then our mind tells us, stops us from reaching discomfort ever. And that's the key. What is the dose specific response? 
Yeah. I use my wife as an example. I will see her grind 15 hours a day, not moving, banging out script, like, like just working on a, as a producer, as a director, as a writer, and just like, oh, she's like, I'm not getting anything accomplished. It's like, you're producing a film, you directed another one, you just finished a musical. It's like, I think you're getting a few things accomplished, but when she's stuck, the more she grinds through it and grinds through it, the the deeper she gets stuck. Mm. And it's when it's like, she's like, fuck it. I'm going to a movie. I'm going to go do, I'm going to go take a class today. I'm going to go work out for an hour and a half. And then I'm just going to go out to, we're just going to go see a movie. Let's just have fun today. Can we? And it's like a day of that. And, or maybe two. And when she comes back, she's got all these ideas. Mm, yeah. And she just lets go. So, but, but if you're not in those moments where you're sitting down, it's like nothing's coming and you're pushing through, well, rest on top of rest isn't going to do that for you, but it's knowing when to engage in with strategy and allowing time for both. Mm. What are your, what's your take on, I think of people who have had really hard experiences and can find themselves really stuck in the effects of that, so stuck in PTSD and really anchored by it. What do you think? I mean, for me, the, re- the, the physical training is such a resource for Processing, processing, because there's the body and the, the, there's the mind. So there's this, there's the, our biology and what happens to our nervous system from physical. And then there's the processing and the understanding and the, the mental work and the coming together of the two. What do you think is the biggest challenge? I mean, this is a hard question because everyone's different and we don't know. I'm not even talking about any specific person or circumstance so I don't know their variables of whether they do train with their body whether they do therapy with their mind like but I just think of the starkness and go what's the answer for some for some of these people how well I can't speak I can't speak to trauma in general because I'm not an expert and I'm not a trained clinician to deal with questions pertaining to PTSD, but I can speak for myself. Mm. And it's just what we talked about. I know for me, exercise has been enormously valuable. One, for the symptoms of Tourette's. Um, Exercise was one of the things that even back in the 80s, my doctors identified as a coping strategy to alter my biochemistry in a way that would mitigate some of the symptoms that I was Mm. struggling with, not only struggling and just doing normal everyday activities, but struggling with the response I got when I engaged in these things. Like, you know, Mm. I would have, I would have my fifth grade teacher mock my tics in front of the class because she had had it with me, What? you know? So she would contort her head and blink her eyes when she spoke to me when she was angry because I, I kept, these inappropriate and and rude outbursts in class. And she did not like that. It was highly disruptive, but I didn't even know I was making these outbursts until like, I don't know, a second after I made it. So, you know, that was her response. The kids were much worse. So I, I was willing to try anything. So exercise was enormously valuable. And emotionally and psychologically, yes. I felt like I had a locus of control over something, some aspect of my life, but yeah. where that gets damaging. And, you know, to be honest, I, I probably pushed it too far at multiple times in my life, but I just pushed it too far when I was in my mid forties. You tore and your peck. <laughs> no, I wish I, I, I would, I would have taken a torn peck easily. I, I completely, I, I detached my peck. Because for me, like training and and, and training very heavy mm. and pushing very very hard, you know it, it it's kind of it, it's not just it's not something I'm doing for the result. Well, for the outward result, there's an inner result, there's an outcome in the moment, and after I train, then I'm going for. I was training like that because I 
even walking into the gym, I was like, okay, you know what? Based on how you're feeling, you know, your travel schedule, you should probably take it easy, take it light back. I, I remember having that thought walking into the gym <laughs> and then everything that I was looking, I was like, okay, it's packed. And I remember getting quite frustrated because I went to the gym at a time where I thought it would be empty, which was disruptive to my daily routine. And then it was anything but empty. I just remember just, uh, you know, I just can't do this today. I've got to train hard and I've got to train heavy. I just remember this unwillingness to go uh, listen to what your body is telling you. And I was just training like that for, I would say a, a few months because I, I was going through something well, not, not trauma, but I was going through something quite emotional where I'd gotten to a point in my life where I knew I needed to make a change and walk away from something. Mm. But the something that, that I was walking away from was so much part of my identity. And it, it, I loved it so much, but I knew this isn't really for me. It's not really serving me. It's not aligned with what I value anymore. So for me, my, 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 methodology was to suppress all of that and not think about it and just train through it and get on with it. Mm. So I wouldn't have to deal with that stuff. And you could go, you could go too far. I, I, I think if you're training to the point where you're trying to use suffering to get out of suffering, that's a no win strategy. That that's like, I'm drunk at a bar and I'm like, you know what? I don't like the way I'm feeling. I don't, I don't want to be intoxicated anymore. And how I deal with it is I order two more whiskeys. That's mm. really not a good mm. strategy. It's illogical, but we use that. If I could just suffer enough, I could get out of my suffering. <laughs> when I, when, when I first, when the, my past first came up into my awareness and I started processing that and seeking therapy, I, I remember, and I talk about this a lot where I, I used to, I'd often go to training I'd rock up and I'd be, I'd kind of be in that, in, in a level of angst without any understanding of why. Like, oh, I don't know why I feel like this, but I know that I'm going to come here and do this class. And one of two things is going to happen by the end. I'm going to feel amazing and just be like, oh, I'll be like a clean slate for the day. I'll, I won't even know. Cause I don't even know what the problem is anyway. There's just this emotional angst. Or by the time we're at the end of the class and we're on the ground doing abs, I'll be in the bathroom howling and crying like it'll so it'll go one or two as we just fix it or it'll bring it to the surface whatever it is and when last year when coach my dog died and I remember I had a few days I didn't do anything and then I went into the gym and I was like I'm gonna go do some training and I started doing some training and I remembered so my heart so what would happen back then and this same feeling and it was so weird to feel something so familiar but be different in the moment. So I had this sense where as soon as my heart rate came up, emotions came up and I and I kind of felt panicky. Um I felt like I was going to like my I was going to have a panic attack. I felt my my throat kind of constricting a little bit and my heart and I just went, "Oh, this feels awfully familiar, but I used to push through this and in this instance, I went Oh, I'm just going to sit with myself for this. I'm I'm not going to train today. And it was so interesting to have, I call it self-compassion, have the self-compassion to go, okay, this is not what we need. I'm going to go and, but it's brought enough of it up for me to process this emotion, which I never could process it before. It was just push, push, push until I either forget about it or it breaks me and it comes out. Mm, wow. Yeah. But weird you know feeling, like it was such a familiar feeling. And I went, oh, I used to so frequently reach this feeling. I've never, I haven't felt that level of angst or stuckness emotionally for a very long time, but it used to be a thing that I felt frequently. Because any emotion would come up as that, because I wasn't very emotionally aware. I didn't do emotions. Uh, so I, I don't know how to interpret what's coming up because I'm not in tuned and, and self-aware on, on how to translate what does this mean in the moment. Yeah. But what's interesting is self-awareness is critical. And uh, we've talked about this on the podcast. A lot of people get upset with the word responsibility because they confuse it with the word fault. It's not yes. your fault. 
you know, victim blaming is when you try to insinuate that it was something about someone who was victimized that caused what happened, Mm. even though they absolutely did not want it to happen and could not prevent it from happening. And that does kind of suck. And and it's, it's infuriating when I, when I see that, but after the fact responsibility is, Mm ability to respond. So fault and responsibility are not the same thing. You know, there, there is self-awareness and then there's responsibility mm-hmm. for healing and moving forward. But what's left out of this conversation so far and so many conversations in this space is we're talking about what we have to do and what we need to be aware of and whilst we're responsible, you know, what, what's interesting in the book Tribe by Sebastian Younger is he talks about, and, and you know, I, I think the book got a little bit of criticism as glorifying war. I don't think he was trying to do that. I, I think there was a little bit of lack of appreciation that when people are desperate and in dire circumstances, yes, it can bring them together as a community. But as we've seen, it could also bring out the worst attributes in humanity. It could destroy communities. It can and has destroyed nations. So that's that, that's looking at it from the other perspective. But so that you know, we're talking about World War II, where even though civilians were being bombed, very often, and th- th- there's there's a lot to that. There there was intense fear, concern. But there wasn't so much of what we would look at as people in mental health crises, because as a function of survival, people had to come together, work together. And those communities became extremely close knit. And he was like, when in tribes, a lot of tribes around the world, when you would go out to war and you would return. It's not like people would hate you and you would have your benefits cut by the, your government and you'd be out there to deal with this stuff on your own. You were welcomed back into the community and there were rituals to reacclimate you back into society. And it's that community. So there's an element of self-reliance, but that can go way too far with resilience. It's about being around people and feeling that you are belonging to a society, you belong to a community, that you're working to serve and sacrifice for that community. So you're a valuable component of a tribe that you yourself value, if that makes any sense. Because, and, and, you know, with, I think, again, it goes back to what's the right dose. I heard Paul Taylor say this on his podcast, where self-care, unchecked can lead to self-indulgence. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and I think that's completely, that doesn't mean like, you know, you need to eat right. You need to rest. You need to you know sleep, um, training, exercise. You need to maybe not say yes to things that you don't have capacity for where it really should be a no. But on the other hand, it's not so much self, it's other. Nancy Eisenberg is a lead researcher in pro-social behaviors. And this is something that's pretty interesting. Pro-social behavior decreases stress hormone levels in the body. Mm. So when you are engaged in helping people, when you are engaged in sharing with others, when you're engaged in comforting other people, it lowers your own stress response. Now, the flip side of of that, the vicious cycle you get into, this is research that came out of Germany. When you have chronically elevated stress hormone levels, particularly the one they looked at was cortisol, you're less likely to engage in pro-social behaviors, especially if you're a more empathetic individual in the study, they called it someone who is high mentalizing, where you can mentally project yourself into that situation of another person and sense their need. So even if you're an empathetic person, especially if you're an empathetic person, if you, if you are chronically stressed, 
it changes your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It changes the wiring in a way that makes you less likely, temporarily anyway, to engage in pro-social behaviors. And by not engaging in pro-social behaviors and going deeper inside yourself, you exacerbate the stress response. Vicious cycle. So sometimes it's not, well, what do I need to seek outside of yourself? Who can I help? Who can I connect with? Who can I share with? community because mm. nothing in nature works the way a lot of self-help suggests we should work show me something in nature that is not highly dynamically complex and integrated with everything else in nature where does that work how do we process i was thinking about this before how do we process um we talk about blame and responsibility and i love that i've referred to that a lot but the idea around an individual who we always, we tend to want to blame. Like how do we move through processing our emotions and our self-compassion and our feeling towards those who have been responsible for what we are going through? compassionately like i think and that's again it's hard because we're talking about that's that's very hard because you have to first acknowledge that you're doing that and let's take a look at a scenario where you absolutely are directly indirectly victimized by injustice yeah that you didn't bring about yeah you have to acknowledge that that i have gone through this Yet at the same time, my blame is the thing that's keeping me stuck in it, yes. not what happened to me or or even what continually is happening to me as a result of this. There's no way out because I'm stuck. In, well, what about and I didn't and, and all of that, all of that's just the well, not in every case. In some cases, that is completely unjustified, like grow up. In other cases, it's justified. It's true. You know, this is not an exaggeration, but the question is, where does that leave me? I'm thinking about Ch- Captain Charlie Plum's reference that hate hate is a poison that eats away at the vessel it's stored in. Mm-hmm. Or I probably got the words wrong, but it's basically what he said. And so Captain Charlie Plum was, for any, for the listeners who haven't heard, prisoner of the... Vietnam War for six years. He went through the most horrific torture and treatment for six years and he's the most, with no PTSD, him and his counterparts that were all prisoners of war, they had next to no PTSD. We talked about the camaraderie and the leadership and the things that the social things that they created inside that environment but yeah, you know, like, and one of the questions well, I asked him was, do you think, do you feel more sorry for the prisoners? Just of, about to mention that. Yeah, the prisoners yeah. of war or the the security guards, the guards. And he, he was like, well, yeah, the guards, because they were, they were indoctrinated into this treating people that way. And just imagine what their lives are like and what guilt and... I don't know, like Yeah, those were human beings. And he was able he was well, he was able to there's a lot of things. Wow, he was able to look at the reality of his situation, mm-hmm. yet at the same time empathize with the state of his captors. Mm-hmm. He had, Charlie Plum is probably one of the most impressive people I've ever met. I've mm-hmm. ever had the privilege of meeting. Um and at the same time it was that connection. Mm. to community and he cites that because he was very clear in our conversation that no matter the level of mental toughness no matter the attitude you would know when someone was about to die when they would transfer them Mm. to a part of the camp where they can no longer be in contact covertly with everybody else to show you the power of community because each of these guys were extremely mentally tough yeah. You know, each of them were well trained. You know, they, they were highly resilient individuals. But it's like when when you're looking at something, 
what what is the one differentiating factor that he cited and it was separation mm. it, it it truly is that community oh that's it and then you just go like we look at all the the things we turn to to try and in inverted commas fix fix our mental illness fix our trauma fix our stuff but all they implemented was connection and the ability to in a place they couldn't see each other and weren't allowed to speak they created a morse code alphabet and they reminisced and they celebrated birthday parties and they used their imagination and they lived these lives that produced the same neurochemistry as if they were actually living that life I think that's one of the things that has made this pandemic quite different because people have lived through wartime situations, which is arguably a lot worse than Mm. having to stay home and (laughs) having Netflix. (laughs) But but, no, but but, uh, the the differentiating factor there, I I, I don't want to take I don't want to take this out of context is People were completely divorced from, I'm, of course, we had Zoom and we had our virtual communities. I don't think it's the same, but it's mm-hmm. where like there, there were loved ones that people didn't see for years. Yeah, There, there, there were people that didn't see people for months in, in, in a real meaningful way. And I, I think how fast people devolved in the pandemic, because some people would say, well, well people just you know, not as strong as they were a half a century ago or or, yeah. or where I grew up. And maybe, maybe that is the case. Maybe. Or maybe it's that interpersonal connection is so critical to who we are to not, o- not only the mechanism by which for the past 200,000 years we were able to survive, but whenever we thrive, it has been together. And that is being removed from our society. And we have seen the devastating after effects of what happens when we do not have that interconnectivity. I think for, for, you know, all the self-help information that is very good. And even though my podcast is a self-help antidote, I do think (laughs) there there are elements of self-help that are enormously valuable, but then there are also enormously destructive elements, which would suggest that it is absolute self-reliance and it is the, the focus, the obsession with me at the expense of we, that's a way forward and a way forward to what? Because it doesn't seem very rewarding in the journey and it doesn't feel like the path toward an obsession with me is going to bring me to a destination that's any more rewarding. As a matter of fact, if you think back in your life, what was the best time in your life? You hear this. It was like, oh, well, we got houses. We're really rich now. But oh, man, you know, when we were together and, and we had that one bedroom apartment, mm-hmm. and we couldn't afford furniture. And it was that we were sitting at that, that old kitchen table that Nana gave us. And we would just sit there, you know, eating Chinese food and just talking all night, you know, with a cheap bottle of wine. That was amazing. We were the happiest then. It's like, it, it, regardless of what that is for you, I, I mean, all right, for me, it might be poor eating Chinese food, drinking cheap wine. For somebody else, it might be an, a different time. But if you think about when you were the happiest, it wasn't when you were in isolation. It's when you were sharing things with other people. It's so true. So true. When were you the happiest? Do you know a weird, do you know a weird um, memory that just popped in my head then was, and I I loved this time when, God, how many years ago was it? it was like oh, well over a decade ago, I got a job working on the Spirit of Tasmania, the ship that travels from Melbourne to Tassie. Because at the time I was living in Tassie. No, I wasn't. I was living in Melbourne, but I thought I'd be able to go home all the time. It'd be an awesome, you know, see my family. Anyway, in order to work on the ship, you had to do the seafarers course, which was a, I think it was a three week course or something down in, on campus in Launceston in Tassie. And so all of the new recruits were down at this. So 
it, probably it was like being back at school. We're living on campus. We did a three-day firefighters course. It was amazing. It We did a um, – out on the – Oh, we did this simulated helicopter rescue inside this. It was amazing. It was like a big storm and it was dark and we had to dive off 10-meter platforms in immersion suits. And I just, like, I remember it so vividly and it's because there were just this handful of people and I didn't even know them at the time, but it was just because it was based around this common interest and we were all doing something together and then hanging out together and debriefing at the end of each day on all of this stuff that... For some of it, for some people, was terrifying. People were having panic attacks, putting the head, the breathing apparatus on for the firefighting course because that was, I mean, you had to get in small spaces and put this apparatus on and anyone who's claustrophobic, that, I mean, and if they didn't do it, they didn't get the job. So it was like your job depends on this. So cool. Like I remember those that, and I those, hated that working seem on that like ship. A very happy time. <laughs> I lasted like a matter of weeks working there. I was I'd picked out everybody in the course. <laughs> I was like, that person's not going to last, and that person's not going to last, and that person's not going to last. And Bobby, I reckon I was the second person to quit my job. <laughs> you ne- you never know. Like like in boot camp, you, you if, if you don't dare play that game because. <laughs> I ate my words. I was like, look at you, you hypocritical bitch. <laughs> You're looking at people like, oh, this person, I don't yep. know. And then, yeah, they, <laughs> they, they wind up thriving. And it's like the person you're like, oh, well, this this dude's a beast. <laughs> so, well, not as not, not so much maybe. I remember the last shift I was going to go on, I, I decided I wasn't going to keep working there, but I was going to go on this last sailing to go and visit my mum. I was like, I'll go, I'll hang out with mum for the last day and that's it. And my boyfriend drove me to the ship and he pulled up in the morning and I was looking at it and I was just I was like in a state and I was just staring at it for about five minutes and then I didn't even look. I didn't. My, my eyes were locked on the ship and I didn't move a muscle and I just said, just take me home. He's like, what? I said, just take me home. I'm not getting on the boat. I'm not getting on there. I hated it. How weird is that? <laughs> just rang them up and was like, sorry, guys, I'm not coming on. <laughs> but I literally just came home on there the other day on a day sail and I was like, oh, I can't sit. I can't be contained for 10 hours straight not doing anything. No like, shit. I, contain, I'm not yeah. built to be contained. <laughs> I paced around that boat driving myself crazy. You're actually making me a bit anxious right now. <laughs> I think, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to... One day when I'm you... I'm just going to end this podcast. <laughs> it's not anyone's fault. It's just... It, 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 I do have a responsibility to end this thing on time. And well, you're already 20 minutes in. late, Bob. You're already 20 minutes late to bloody end it, or at least 15. Well, I and was you're having carrying. so much fun <laughs> up until your, your pacing story, which completely <laughs> ruined it for me. But just thank you, Tiffany. No, I mean that. That's not just sarcasm. And thank you, everyone. That's definitely not sarcasm. This is just banter. Me and Tiffany love each other very much. We just hang shit on each other because it's it's where we're from. It's part of our culture and we have issues. So <laughs> see you next week. Bye, love. Bye, everyone. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Visit us at theselfhelpantidote.com to share your feedback, insights, and recommendations on what topics you'd like us to explore in the future.